I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, we This is part of our Fair Trade Explorer program. Uh, this is our um, virtual way that we can uh, spread the good news of fair trade. And tonight's subject is, of course, agents agents of change to um, one of the one of the things uh, last year's group we called them agents of change and this year's group I gave them the opportunity if they would like to rename themselves and I think they thought that this was that would that was a cool name that they should keep so it's agents of change too um, so before we get started um, so whoever just came in can you please mute yourself please Okay, so uh, before we get started, I think it's important that, that we all start on the same page uh, so that we have a basis of where we're going. So what is fair trade? Um, so this is what I call our textbook definition. It's an alternative trading system, and it's set up to provide sustainable employment opportunities for artisans and farmers below the poverty line in developing countries. And by sustainable employment, we mean fair pay. Um, everyone should get paid um, get paid what the work what their work what their work is worth. Um, it means uh, safe working conditions. You know, no one should have to worry of whether or not they're going to be safe till the end of their shift. Um, it means care for the environment. It means doing no harm. Um, it also means uh, equal pay for equal work. The work is the work. Men and women get paid the same amount. That is especially important in places where job opportunities for women are pretty limited or non-existent. So this is the basis that our fair trade ambassadors have been, been building this year. So what is a fair trade ambassador? Um, so this is two statements that came out of the brochure that, that our fair trade that I passed out at the beginning of the year, uh, but it's a learning opportunity for selected high school juniors uh the six that you're going to meet shortly they applied and out of the many who applied we interviewed them uh and these are the ones that were selected and i will tell you i could i couldn't be more proud of them if i was their, if i was their dad you know it, it, i'm their fair trade dad i suppose but i couldn't be more proud of them uh one of the things that we try to do with the program is you know to take them from high school fair trade ambassadors to lifelong fair trade advocates. And that's really what uh, the program is all about. So just some highlights, it, it's, it was started in 2007 as part of our education program. Uh, and this is our 15th class. I'm not sure that the, this class knew that. And then when we finish, when they finish, they will be one of 72 fair trade ambassador alumni. And as I was looking at the list of attendees, I think we have a couple of our uh, uh, alumni who are here. So that is always good to see uh, participants of the past come and support the uh, participants uh, of the present. But what does a fair trade ambassador do? Uh, they learn. Uh, one of the things we do, we start at the beginning of the school year, and we meet basically once a month, um, average once a month, and we have learning sessions where we look at uh, different parts of fair trade. So one night we talk about fair trade in the environment. Uh, another night we talk about child labor. Uh, then this year we talked about fair trade in COVID. So there's different, uh, different aspects that we do. And the, the whole point of the learning is that as the year goes on, they develop their own voices and they become more confident in, in what they're learning. They plan, uh, they were separated into teams and they planned an event this year called Fair Trade, uh, Fair Trade Ambassador Day, which was held back in March. Uh, each of them took a day in the spring. There are several days uh, that we celebrate. One was International Women's Day uh, the other one was World Fair Trade Day and then Earth Day. And they each, each took one and, and planned, and, and it was an awesome day. It's one of my favorite days of the year to see them uh, confident about what, what, they're, what they're learning and being able to express it on their own. They volunteer. Uh, one of their requirements is that they volunteer at least twice a month. That's five or six uh, uh, hours a month. 
uh, they get to travel. We're planning to take a road trip on June 14th, where we're going to go see uh, some of our uh, fair trade partners that are in the region. And the other thing they get to do is teach, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, part of their uh, part of their commitment to the program is that they have to give a presentation about fair trade. This year they had to, they have to do it twice. Have and had some of them have given it, some of them haven't. Uh, they have to give it to a group at their school or their church, and then uh, they also have to give it here, which is why we're all here. Um, so these are our fair trade ambassadors this year, and these are our speakers tonight. We have Alia Nawab, and I've always say that incorrectly, and I pro I apologize, Alia. Joseph Ng, Olivia Galligan. Madeline Langdon, Riley Stark, and Juliana Marker. And this is the exact order that they will be speaking tonight. And I will allow them to tell you what their subject matter is uh, so as not to uh, sort of, I don't want to tell their story. I think it's important that they tell that on their own. So the plan for the evening. Uh, so we're going to go in order. Uh, they will have a specific am amount of time that they will speak. And we're going to go one right after the other, and, and that sounds like we're going to go fast, but they'll have adequate time to speak, and all of the questions will be at the end. So I will be monitoring the chat, so if you would like to put a question in the chat so you don't forget or a specific point of, of somebody's presentation, put it there, and then we will address all of those at the end of, of their presentations. So without further ado, uh, we are going to start with Miss Alia Nawab. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers. So this is kind of like the impacts of the environment without fair trade. So farmers face exploitation at the hands of big businesses, and they also face incredibly, incredibly bad working conditions and extreme poverty. And so for an example, cocoa farmers earn just 6% of the final value of cocoa that they like make. And so these bad conditions cause them to turn to cheap um, agriculture practices. And then that damages surrounding ecosystems such as like that can leave pesticides like runoff in water and that can, that can harm kind of like the pH of water kind of that type of stuff. And so um, this can further worsen the degraded soil and it can lead to desertification, saltwater pollution, soil erosion, and the excessive use of toxic pesticides that they're already seeing in kind of like the environment now. And with such bad conditions, farmers are turning to the method of quantity rather than quality. And this can lead to situations of um, deforestation, which can then again negatively impact several other environmental aspects. And so this is the environment with fair trade. And so fair trade protection is ingrained in environment. Environmental protection is ingrained within fair trade. And so many fair trade co-ops are um, investing in reforestation projects. And so planting trees on used up land can prevent soil erosion and reduce climate change by the trees taking in and storing the carbon dioxide and the trees also provide biodiversity and provide habitats for wildlife. And so fair trade impacts don't only extend to the environment, but one of the bigger concerns within that area is agriculture. And so fair trade and agriculture, and so how fair trade impacts agriculture to bring you better and safer products. So fair trade is normally associated with safe um, working conditions, better labor practices, and a living wage. However, fair trade also impacts the environment in several different ways, the first being through agriculture. To sell fair trade products, farmers are required to improve soil and water health, manage pests without the use of harmful chemicals, and reduce car their carbon footprint and protect biodiversity. These restrictions allow farmers to improve their land and develop rich soil that promotes healthy plant and animal life. And another impact is prohibiting deforestation and by, by buying fair trade farmed products, consumers are encouraging healthier farming habits and they're buying healthier products while eliminating the need for additional farmland, which is then kind of like giving back to the environment itself. And so here's just like two pictures of kind of like farmers that participate in fair trade while being like giving back to agriculture and that type of thing. And so 
some impacts like other than agriculture is so fair trade impacts are not limited to limited to farming. They stretch to consumers and big businesses. By consumers buying fair trade products, they are keeping their money out of the hands of big businesses and in the hands of small business owners or artisans. This limits the income of big businesses. This limits the income that big businesses could be gaining and reduces the likelihood of their expansion. And by reducing the, their likelihood of expansion, this keeps habitats, forests, ecosystems, animals, and communities all safe from harm. And so this is Edith, and this is kind of the community that she's built from being a like being a part of um, a fair trade co-op. So here's her story. So this is Edith. She lives within a household of seven in the Ivory Coast, and Edith is determined to earn enough money to take care of her and her son. Edith has a passion for cocoa. Her and her friend took part in a women's school of leadership, a fair trade project to bring up the confidence and skills in women of the cocoa farming communities. The two women came back full of ideas and their plan not only helped themselves, but it helped the women in their community make it steady income, like even to this day, just a year round. And so the women like bought land together and they split the land between producing cocoa and producing other like um, products like tomatoes and kind of like nuts and that type of thing. And so Edith and her community learned the right way of farming and that led them to not using any like harmful chemicals or any like pesticides like that. Therefore, they could be part of a fair trade co-op They're like by meeting those kind of like limitations. And so they, they value the land and not just what the land can do for them. And so I actually found a video about like Edith and I kind of wanted to share that with everybody because I thought it was really cool. But can you share um, the other screen rather than the one. Yeah, it's very that's awesome. Okay, Thank I got you. it. <laughs> Good job. Um, here is the video. No sound. Okay, so that's the video and I thought it was really empowering and I was like, that's kind of something that everyone deserves to see. And so I have just one more slide. And so it's kind of like what we can do and how our kind of like us being consumers impacts kind of like the buying process. And so by buying fair trade products, consumers are providing producers with the opportunity to make a living wage participate in an environmental education, training, quality testing on, on their farms, and buying efficient equipment. By buying fair trade, by, by buying fair trade, consumers are helping to cut out the middlemen and rightfully pay workers the money that they deserve. Consumers are also consumers also are also supporting a better way of life for many people. They are encouraging a healthier, unsafe agriculture practices, safe working conditions, and deep decouraging deforestation. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alia. Good job. Uh, so we're going to keep the train moving. So um, go ahead and stop. You shut you stop scare. Shh. Wow. Sharing your screen. All right, next up we have Joseph Ng. And uh, right. So over this past year, I've been learning about fair trade and its many aspects and its many impacts 
on not only the environment, but on multiple minority groups. But the subject that I chose today and that I'm extremely passionate in is child labor. And although the material in this presentation may be sensitive or very disturbing at times, it's crucial that we bring awareness to this in order we, so then we can take the proper steps and necessary movements in order to protect our future generations and protect the lives of children all over the globe. Now, as you may have learned, and as I currently was learning in my US history class, United States history has had a problem with child labor. From the early 1900s, when companies like these massive robber barons were trying to minimize their costs, they would take the evil step of exploiting children, a almost zero costing uh, source of labor. And what this led to was evil and horrendous conditions where children were exploited in the United States here. However, thankfully, the story in the United States had a happy story where we passed legislation and we passed many laws in 1938 in order to prevent the exploitation of children. And unfortunately, as a result of this, Americans have lost sight of this constant threat of child labor, and that has almost led us to be contempt in this child exploitation. And so it's crucial that we bring awareness to this today. And as we can see in this photo, the conditions that these children have been put in are relatively the same. And the similarity between the two photos is almost uncanny. And what this shows is that although child labor may be gone in the United States, and although we may not see it on a daily basis, or we may not hear of personal friends or families who have gone through it, that doesn't change the fact that millions of children all over the world are still experiencing the same exploitation that was going on in the United States in the early 1900s. And so it's crucial that we take the necessary steps in order to prevent that. Uh, here's another photo of children working in a sewing factory in, in the United States. And you can only imagine what could happen if the children got their hands stuck in machinery. They'd be cast aside and, and left for dead. And unfortunately, these same conditions are still going on in today's world. And millions of children are being affected by this. And so it shows that these conditions really haven't changed. And so although we may not see it, it's important to realize that it's still there. Sorry. So in one story I'd like to bring up is a boy named Ali. Ali worked on a coca plantation in West Africa that investigators say supplied coca to Nestle and other well-known chocolate brands. Ali didn't go there by choice. He was kidnapped from his village. He says, I was walking home from school and then the big men took me. He didn't know what was happening until he got to the plantation. There were boys everywhere, sweating and working under the coca trees. There were big angry men shouting at them to work harder and whipping them when they didn't. That's when I knew I'd never see my parents or village again. I was put to work as soon as I got there, he said. His workday usually began uh, at sunrise and ended well past sunset. All of the boys slept in a barn and were locked in at night. He says that boys as young as 10 were using chainsaws to clear the forest so they could plant more coca trees. They had to climb to the top of the trees and use machetes to harvest the coca pods. A young boy climbing a tree with a big knife is not safe, he said. He shows the scars on his hands and says, matter of factly, everybody gets cut. Sometimes the knife slips. Once the coca pods were cut and harvested, the boys packed them in burlap bags. Some of the bags were bigger than me and were really heavy. Sometimes it would take two people to lift the bag on my shoulders. And when you didn't carry the bags fast enough, you got whipped. Investigators say that Ali's experience is typical of child laborers in West Africa. Once the boys are working on the plantations, they have little hope of escaping on their own. Ali has never tasted chocolate and says he never will. Ali's story does end differently than other children working as slaves. He managed to escape, went back to his village and was finally reunited with his parents. Ali is now only 12 years old. Unfortunately, Ali's story and the, and the exploitation he underwent is similar to more than 152 million children's lives. 
these children fall victim to child labor. And due to COVID-19 and the vast amount of social distancing protocols and the shutting down of factories, that number has likely rose another 9 million children, 88 million boys and 64 million girls. Child labor is defined as work that is harmful to a child's health and well-being and or with their education, leisure and development. Forms of child labor include drug production, trafficking, forced recruitment into armed conflict, prostitution, pornography, debt bondage, and slavery. Oh, sorry. And unfortunately, these conditions that children are being put through is being motivated and paid by these many companies that we buy here in the United States. Just like what was happening in the US history in 1900s, Companies try to minimize their profits, and these companies do this in today's world by still exploiting these children across the globe. And although it's very unfortunate, it shows that we, the consumer, are a part of this problem and are continually uh, allowing this exploitation of children to continue when we buy in vast amounts from these companies. And so it's crucial to bring awareness to this and so we can cut down on this habit and reduce this company's profits so we can harm them from exploiting these children. Another way we can solve this child labor is through fair trade. Now, child labor is very pro problematic. It's the product of systematic inequalities and unfair trading conditions, especially endemic poverty. If vulnerable families are unable to achieve a decent living, ending child labor will remain difficult. It's easy for me or you to sit here in these developed nations where we don't even have to worry about what we're gonna eat and tell these families that they can't send their children. In reality, these families, this is a viable option. If it means that they don't have to feed one more mouth, then these families unfortunately have to take these horrible measures in order to protect their families. So that means better incomes, quality schooling, addressing discrimination, exploitation and abuse, awareness of child rights, legal interventions, and social changes are all necessary factors to combat child labor. And that's exactly what fair trade does. A study done on December 10th, 2021, including 184 producers, 122 community members, and many more found that fair trade programs are far more effective than international efforts like the UN or other NGOs in their efforts to stop child labor. Fair trade is committed to fighting the root causes of child labor. It prohibits children below the age of 15 to work. It prohibits children under 18 to undertake work that jeopardizes their schooling or development. And it tackles poverty and lack of access to education. On top of that, by fair trade allowing a stable and secure income and wage to these families, these families no longer have to send their children away. They can keep them in their households and prioritize their basic humanity and dignity. And when families do that, when families use fair trade, we have stories like Diego here. Diego is 11 years old and lives in the Dominican Republic. His father is a member of a fair trade coca cooperative, and he wrote the following essay about his daily life. I wake up to the sun rising and the rooster crowing. I get dressed quickly into my school uniform. My father is a coca farmer and has already left for work with my uncles. I always tell my dad that I want to help him, but he says that school is more important and always comes first. While my mother prepares breakfast, I feed the chickens and goats. Then I wake up my younger sister and brother and help them put their school uniforms on. When breakfast is ready, we eat a piece of sweet bread and drink a cup of hot chocolate. Then it's time to leave for school. It's a three kilometer walk. The road is dirty, so we have to be very careful not to get our uniforms dirty. We pass many animals along the way. We walk by mango trees, and when it's the right season sometimes, my sister and I climb the trees to pick mangoes to eat as we walk. At my school, the kids are in kindergarten to fifth grade, my brother in second grade, my sister in fourth grade, and I am in fifth grade. When school is over, I walk home with my sister and brother. I make sure that they are safe as we walk. When I get home, I have to feed the chickens and goats, and when my father gets home, he helps me with my homework. 
I usually sleep well and then I do it all over again the next day. Life is good. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Good job. Some fast fashion. Um, I plan on to. I plan on going into the fashion industry. So one of the reasons why I joined the fair trade um, ambassador program is because I really saw how I can make my company as ethical and sustainable as possible when we get to that point. So the global fast fashion market reached a value of. 68,634.9 million in 2020. And that was a big problem. So first we're gonna talk about sweatshops. A sweatshop is a factory, particularly in clothing, where workers are employed at low wages for long hours in poor conditions. The term sweatshop was coined in the late 1800s to describe working conditions in the clothing industry. Sweatshops help big corporations put out, push out inventory quickly and cheaply. Some workers make three cents per work hour, often working 100 or more hours per week. Companies such as Gap, ASOS, Disney, H&M, Forever 21, and many more still use this style of labor to exploit and harm the health of the individuals lower on their company's pyramid. The problem is not the consumers, it is the corporations and higher ups that decided that making quick cash for poor quality garments is more important than a human's life. So here we have some fast fashion brands, which you can almost see pretty much everybody on the streets wearing these days. Uh, Shein, Forever 21, Zara, and H&M. Um, when I first started the Just Creations program, I knew Shein and Forever 21 were bad, but I didn't know as much about Zara and H&M's like, practices. So some fast fashion facts. 700 gallons of water are used to make one cotton shirt. Three out of four garments will end up in a landfill and 2% of garment workers are making a living wage. And each person spends $1,700 on clothing each year, which I'm like, that is pretty accurate. So here we have fashion seasons. Before fashion, fast fashion was universalized, we would see two fashion seasons each year, spring and summer and fall and winter. It's just something that I feel like everybody's pretty like used to with very like luxurious, luxurious brands, but that used to be for everybody. And this number has grown to 52, which means that new collections are created and pushed out every single week, which creates micro trends that are un unsustainable and cause items to be thrown out more quickly, which has the like TikTok and Instagram has really like pushed those micro trends out, which are clothes that you're only gonna wear for a short amount of time and you don't need to have such non-reusable garments. So now we're gonna get kind of sad. I'm preparing you. On the 24th of April, 2013, a building housing five garment factories in Dhaka, Bangladesh, collapsed killing 1,132 workers and injuring more than 2,500 others. This is now known as the Rana Plaza disaster. It is one of the worst industrial accidents on record. It was an avoidable tragedy. The day before the collapse, the workers were removed for an inspection of cracks that had appeared in the walls. The inspectors declared the building structurally sound and the day went on as normal. The next morning, workers continued to express their concerns, being told they would lose their jobs if they did not continue. The power cut out and the eight-story building collapsed within 90 seconds. The companies that need to be held accountable for these deaths are Walmart, Children's Place, Primark, Gap, and about 220 others. And this isn't the only like disaster that's been in a sweatshop. There is not a single sweatshop on earth that is good in any sense of the matter. Like you cannot, there's nothing you can say that'll make it any better. So how can we help? If we stop supporting these brands, they won't have the power to take advantage of their employees, demand these corporations to take responsibility and be transparent about their production practices. If we spread fair trade labor, it equally reimburses workers for their labor and closes the gap between higher ups and people actually doing the work. It allows millions of people to be human again and live normal lives. And that is all I have to share today. Here we go. 
Yes. All right. So next up, uh, we have Madeline Langdon, and she will she will share. Okay. So for my project, I chose to do a corporate hall of shame, um, highlighting some of the companies that I believe. Um, exhibit traits of what fair trade is trying to fight against. Um, so I chose three companies that I view as some of the most common companies that we use in the US and also some of what I personally think is the worst. So you may be asking, what's the big deal? Companies will be companies, right? Um, no, not necessarily true. Um, it's a lot bigger than just that. First of all, these companies own everything. Um, which means that they've made themselves pretty inescapable, um, which is bad not only for the consumer, but also the products, which are going to be less options in the market if the companies are taking over. Second, they have lots of money, like lots of money, like billions of dollars. Um, and with money comes power, which brings me to my next point. Um, their impact is huge. They have an impact on the economy, on culture, and on everyone's daily lives. So in my opinion, it's a pretty big deal. So, and here's just an example of everything that these companies own. You can see how I, I think that we probably all have at least one of, I, one of these items on here in our homes right now. Like they own so many things. So my first company that I chose is Walmart, um, home of crazy looking people. Unfortunately, that is not the only thing that they are home of. <laughs> Um, Walmart has been criticized heavily as one of the worst places to work. They have a bad reputation for discrimination, unsafe working conditions, and majorly underpaying their employees. Um, honestly, there is a whole bunch of things that are talking about how bad Walmart is to work for. In fact, there is an entire Wikipedia page online dedicated to why Walmart is so bad. You can find it. I found it when I did my research <laughs> um, and I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, next, they use sweatshop and prison labor. One of the worst stories I heard was out of about a garment factory in Bangladesh um, that made clothes for Walmart. On November 24th, 2012, there was a fire in the building due to electrical issues. When people tried to leave, they were forced to go back to their machines. Um, 112 people died, many jumping out of the eight story building and trying to escape the fire. Um, Walmart denied association with this factory. Um, however, all the clothes in the factory had Walmart's logo on them. Um, and it was later found that the main reason the electrical fire and safety hadn't been approved was because Walmart, a Walmart official had refused to raise how much they paid the factories in order to help make improvements um, with the fire safety and electrical safety. They also have a history of bribery, um, especially in Mexico, where they would pay off local officials so that permits could be expedited for construction and operation of some of their stores. So yeah, the next company I have is Mars. Um, these creators are some of the favorite candy I think of everyone here. They are the candy people. Um, but they have also refused to acknowledge their detrimental effect that their production has on the environment. This includes deforestation, lots of greenhouse gas emission to the, due to their animal agriculture, and the destruction of the rainforest due to their use of palm oil. Um, they don't pay their overseas workers enough. And on top of that, they use child labor and slavery to harvest cocoa beans in West Africa. Um, the company has even said, and I quote, um, supply chains may be infected with the worst forms of child labor. Um, Mars chooses to buy their beans from Cote d'Ivoire, which is notorious for its abusive work conditions. Um, Mars was involved in a court case against their ways of labor where they successfully argued that it has no duty to disclose its awareness of possible slave labor involvement in its chocolates on the label because sla child, child slavery doesn't cause an unreasonable safety hazard. Um, there is no physical or safety defect in the confections as a result of nasty labor practices. And so no reason to warn consumers. Um, and unfortunately, most other candy companies are like this as well, which brings me to my next company, Nestle. Um, so like with Mars, um, here's all the things that they own, by the way, um, or some of them, I guess. 
Um, like with Mars, there are lots of ties to child labor and human trafficking. In fact, these companies were involved in a child labor child slavery lawsuit where eight children claimed that they were used as slave labor on cocoa plantations. They accused the corporations of aiding in the legal in, in sla the illegal enslavement of thousands of children on cocoa farms in their supply chains. My second point, and you may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Um, in order to try and sell more baby formula in the 1970s, they sent saleswomen dressed as nurses to underdeveloped countries to trick women into thinking formula was better than actually breastfeeding. Um, they were given free samples that were weighed and packaged strategically to last up to the day when mothers get fully dependent on the formula and stop lactating themselves. Um, this led to thousands of infants' deaths as the mothers were swapping Nestle baby formula for breast milk. This left the, the children deficient in the necessary nutrients that breast milk provides. And I think the worst impact was the underdeveloped regions of the world where mothers were diluting the formula with more water to save money um, and were unknowingly starving the children. Um, breast milk provides all elements vital for the development of the baby and its immune system. With the lack of natural milk, the babies from underdeveloped regions with no access to clean water suffered from many diseases and died. And they are still pushing for baby formula in these countries today. Um, oh, okay. Um, Nestle is also like Mars um, because it ruins the environment with their agricultural practice and deforestation. But they are also major contributors to water and land plastic pollution due to being the number one producer of single use plastic water bottles. Not only that, but this kind of brings me to my next point, which is the water scandal. Um, all the water bottles they have from are from groundwater, um, which they exploit in areas where public need is most and make a profit. Um, the company is also guilty of taking water sources from countries where people are forced to drink dirty water as their clean water sources are acquired by Nestle for their bottled water plants. One example of this, and I was really shocked to find this out, um, was in Flint, Michigan, where Nestle took 200 gallons of water out of Lake Michigan near Flint every minute um, during their water crisis that they have. So what can we do? Now, here's the main answer, fair trade, obviously. Fair trade helps with every single one of their discrepancies that these companies make. It helps with the environment. It helps with better ways of production. It helps keep children out of strenuous ways of labor and get a better education. Um, it helps making sure that people are, paired, are paid well and don't have discrimination to the level that they do in these companies. Also, do your research on who you buy from. Um, if you do your research, you can know more and be more informed about the companies that you're buying from and their practices. And with this, you're gonna be able to feel better about the products that you do buy. And here are some great fair trade brands. Um, we have Equal Exchange, Divine Chocolate, Patagonia, Coco Kind, Koguchi, uh, Minga, Upavim, Thousand Villages, Buniad, and Starfish Projects. Um, all of these companies are fair trade and actively make an effort to make the world a better place. And many of them are actually sold at Just Creations. So you can find them there and that's it. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, good job. Uh, so next we're gonna go to Riley Stark. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Riley, and I am so ex excited to speak with you all today. Over the course of the school year, I've been participating in the Fair Trade Ambassador Program at Just Creations, as you all know. And today, I will be telling you all about my experience as an ambassador, an overview of what Fair Trade is, and its connection to something we all likely have experiences with chocolate. Now, I'm willing to bet that almost everyone on this call has some experience with chocolate, whether that be in eating, baking, or if you don't like chocolate, 
seeing enormous bags filled with it at the grocery store. Now, just a quick side note before I begin talking about this more in depth, my goal for this presentation is for it to be as interactive as possible, given that we are on a virtual call. So I would like for a couple of people to unmute and just give me some ideas of the biggest name brand chocolates that you can think of. I'll give you a couple of seconds for that. Cadbury. Hershey's. Mm -hmm. Nestle. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. All right, some <laughs> others that you all didn't mention were Dove, M&M, and Mars. Now, coincidentally, these brands all fall in the bottom half of this graph that can be found in the Better World Shopping Guide. Now, all of the ambassadors have a copy of this. Thank you thanks to Patrick. This is a small book with information on nearly every item you might come across in the grocery store. It evaluates different brands based on their morals, environmental sustainability, and whether or not they are a quote, corporate villain. As you can see on the screen, Crunch, Nestle, to no surprise, has earned this title. In one of our learning sessions earlier this year, Patrick, who lovingly referred to Nestle as the devil. But the reasoning behind this, it has been noted that Crunch aggressively takes over family farms, won the most irresponsible corporation award, and was involved in a child labor lawsuit. That being said, child labor is the most prominent issue within the chocolate industry. In Nigeria, children are trafficked from across the country and Burkina Faso by recruiters to produce, to produce cocoa. Some are even sold by their parents. The recruiters are paid for their recruitment of the children and many receive no pay for their work at all. They are also tasked with, with difficult and dangerous tasks, including handling sharp tools, carrying heavy loads and handling pesticides without protective equipment. They work under the threat of violence for not working as expected. Children from across Cote d'Ivoire, as well as migrant children, are working under conditions of forced labor on Ivoirian cocoa farms. Some are sold by their parents to traffickers, some are kidnapped, and others migrate willingly but fall victim to traffickers who sell them to recruiters. Children are held against their will on isolated farms, locked in their living quarters at night, and are threatened and beaten if they try to escape. Again, they are also tasked with performing difficult and dangerous work. Besides this complex issue, cocoa farmers are also severely underpaid, despite the fact that the profits of chocolate manufacturers and retailers continue to increase, cocoa farmers have been less fortunate. On average, they receive only 1-2% to 2 of the final value of a name brand chocolate bar. This is down from 16% in the 1980s. This means that when you buy a chocolate bar for around $2, the cocoa farmer that was exploited to produce it only receives about 3 cents. Although the life of a chocolate, of a cocoa farmer's Oh my goodness. Uh, although the reality of a cocoa farmer's life is grim, fair trade does fortunately offer a solution. Fair trade focuses on the unity of producers, companies, and consumers, meaning that everyone works together to create a product. It's a more equitable way of producing and buying goods. As some of the other ambassadors have touched on, it's more environmentally conscious. And due to these ideas, it can be seen as an alternative to free trade. Fair trade operates under these nine principles, a few including to respect cultural identity, support safe and empowering working conditions, and to ensure the rights of children. But why should you buy fair trade chocolate? One, it's better for you and it tastes better. Two, it supports workers and local communities. Three, it's fueled by genuine beliefs. And four, it makes you proud of the good cause that you're supporting. I'm now going to highlight a specific fair trade chocolate brand that proves to be different from others. This doesn't mean that the other brands such as Equal Exchange are not as successful or as fair trade. The divine story is just especially interesting to me. You can find chocolates from both Equal Exchange and Divine at Just Creations. Divine is a fair trade chocolate company in which the cocoa farmers themselves are the majority owners. Specifically, 
The shareholder of Divine Chocolate is Kuapa Koku, and I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Farmers Union, a cooperative of 100,000 cocoa farmers in Ghana who grow the finest quality cocoa for our everyday and seasonal collections. The farmer's ownership stake in Divine Chocolate is a first in the fair trade world, and that is directly from their website. This model of business is classified as a social enterprise because it is not only driven by profits, but also by a social mission. As co-owners, the cocoa farmers receive a share of the distributable profits made from chocolate sales. This means that they are fairly compensated for their work and encouraged to invest it back into their lives. Divine implements this through two different funding projects, the fair trade premium and the fair trade minimum price. The premium is a payment of $240 per ton of cocoa that farmers decide how to invest into community initiatives. The minimum price is a guaranteed minimum price of $2,400 per ton of cocoa that protects farmers from any price drops in the market. Divine strives to offer the best opportunities for their farmers by upholding fair trade principles in these business practices. We're now going to play a short Kahoot to kind of review this information and just um, kind of recap what we've learned. So if you all will please go to kahoot.it, you can literally just type that into Safari or whatever browser you're using and put the game code in whenever I pull it up on the screen. Can you all still see this? I guess I'll find out when people join. And the time timer refreshes whenever um, any person enters, so you all have time. If you haven't joined already, I'm going to ask that you don't and let's just let this timer run out so that we can go ahead and get started. Very happy that you all got that right. Ooh. Ooh, kind of some mixed. Awesome. Okay, this is the last question. <laughs> Sorry. 
and Nestle. Oh my gosh. All right. Congratulations to everybody who won. I know. I just want to thank, oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. I just want to thank you all so much for letting me speak with you all. And I also want to thank everyone at Just Creations for giving me this amazing opportunity and helping me discover a new passion of mine and also connecting me with some amazing people. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you Riley. Great job. Uh, so now we're going to go to Juliana Markert. Okay, so um, for my presentation, I wanted to compare fair trade and free trade because I think when you're looking at fair trade, it really helps to see the impact that it has on like artisans lives when you compare it to free trade, which is the norm. So first, I just wanted to have a little slide on just creation so that when I present when I presented it to my class and if some people here don't really know about the story, you have a little bit of background. So Just Creations is a values-driven marketplace that advocates for marginalized communities or artisans and farmers through promotion of fair trade and social justice. And that's the mission on the website. So um, before we get into what fair trade is, I personally think it's helpful when you're talking about such a large, such a large issue to have kind of faces or to kind of personalize it so you can really see how it affects people's lives. So this is Ahmad and Darman and their coffee farmers at the Fairtrade Copton Gaia Megha Versary Cooperative in Indonesia. Um, okay, so Fairtrade is an arrangement between the makers of products and the companies that sell them. Fairtrade ensures that the farmers and artisans are paid fairly for their products and work in safe and ethical conditions. And that's a very simple way of putting the relationship. But um, as you can see on this wheel, you, there's a lot of different goals and priorities that fair trade works to achieve and um, a few I kind of want to zero in on are creating opportunity, paying promptly and fairly and supporting safe and empowering working conditions. So creating opportunity when fair trade says it aims to create opportunity, it means that they want artisans and the makers of their products and the farmers to really be able to build a career in what they're doing and use their talents and creativity. Whereas someone working maybe in a factory that's free trade would have just to keep sewing shirt sleeves, like maybe they have a quota to fill of 60 shirt sleeves an hour. Someone who's working in um, fair trade will be, have more creativity to really make their product and make it their own. So that's something that's really special. Also paying artisans promptly and fairly. This allows for artisans to be able to support their families and to not have to work paycheck to paycheck. They're able to afford things like visits to the doctors and never having to worry about where their next meal will, will come from. Um, the third one, supporting safe and empowering working conditions. So fair trade prioritizes the people over the product or profit. So they will never have their workers working in unsafe conditions to meet to meet a deadline like some other factories might. So that's something that makes fair trade really special when compared to free trade. So free trade, here's the definition. Um, it's an international trade left to its natural course without tariffs, quotas, or other restrictions. So free trade's lack of restrictions allows for the exploitation of workers and the legalization of dangerous working conditions. Through free trade zones, factories can ignore the legal minimum wage, which allows brands to compete who can pay their workers the lowest. Also through free trade, sweatshops are commonplace. Free trade is also the international norm when it comes to trade. So when you think of stores like Walmart or the clothing brand Gap or Target, chances are the vast majority of their products are gonna be made with free trade unless they're stated to be fair trade. And that is just an image from a garment workshop in Cambodia. Um, comparing free trade and fair trade. Free trade, like I said, prioritizes profit over the safety of their employees, while fair trade prioritizes their workers over their profit. Free trade also practi uses practices that harm the environment, while fair trade focuses on reforestation and doing using practices that will help preserve our environment 
For example, according to the World Economic Forum, fashion production makes up 10% of humanity's carbon emissions, and also 85% of textiles end up in the dump each year, which kind of leads into the next bullet point, which is free trade mass produces products. Well, fair, fair trade products are made with care. That kind of helps, is another example of how fair trade prioritizes the environment. They're not mass producing a million different products to make profit. So products are made with more thought and there aren't products ending up in the dump and things like that. Um, and the last point that free trade employees are most more often than not pay, not paid enough to live fruitful lives while fair trade artisans are paid fairly and able to support themselves through their craft and their careers. For example, with free trade, 85% of garment workers do not earn minimum wage, yet majority of them work 60 to 70 hour weeks. Um, the life of a free trade garment worker. So here's just a story that will kind of give some insight into the life of someone who works, who lives this life. Parul Bajam is a worker at A Plus Clothing Factory in Dhaka, Bangladesh. She, her day kind of looks like she will start towards a six story building at 8 a.m. She'll work for 12 hours, returning home at 8 p.m. to her daughter and nieces. Their home is just one room in a tin shed shanty where they share a bathroom and stove with 30 other residents. And this image here is an image of a shanty town in Bangladesh. So this is an example of what she would be coming home to at the end of her day. Although her salary is $63 a month, it's 66% above the basic industry wage. She struggles to make ends meet, although she has been sewing for 25 years in the industry. A quote from her is, I want to make decent people of my daughters by letting them study so I can give them to a good man so they can live their lives peacefully, that I can die seeing them happy. This is what I ask for God. Also, with her working in the factory, the factory does not provide food and her and other workers have to wear masks because of the lint polluting the air from the textiles. Um, also, she said that it's really tough to maintain the family budget. Whenever someone gets sick, I have to cut our food budget. So I thought that was really important that they can't afford to go to the doctor or if they have to go to the doctor, they'll have to cut back on food, which is very, just a basic human need. Um, also, Perul herself can barely sign her name, so she hasn't had a chance to get an education because she has to work. To kind of compare to that, the life of a fair trade artisan, um, here's Rena Davery, and she works with the Babor and Handmade Paper Project in Agalahara, Bangladesh. Rena is a mother of two. She makes paper and weeds that she makes paper from weeds that are invasive to ponds in southern Bangladesh. She dyes the handmade paper for Babor Inc., a fair trade artisan partner. Through her income, she's in she is able to afford schooling for her children, build savings, and even make home improvements. A quote from her is, I want my son to be an educated person and have a better job. If my parents educated me, I could work in an office. I want my daughter to be educated so she can do an important job. Rena herself was only able to attend school through sixth grade because she was in an arranged marriage when she was 13 but she wants a better life for her son and daughter. Um, and this is a picture of her son, Anjan, when he was 12 and he's studying, he's able to get an education because her, his mother's employment isn't forcing him to go into work as well. So also uh, a kind of update on the story is that her son is currently enrolled in dental school and her daughter is completing her nursing degree in DACA. Another thing that I thought was kind of sweet about Rena's story is that when she was a kid, she was unable to afford gold earrings, but today her and her daughter both wear gold or ear, gold earrings. So it's kind of just a little thing, but it's a sign of financial security. And I thought it was kind of a sweet example of the generational stability and impact that fair trade has. So here are my sources. Some of the main sources I used were the World Fair Trade Organization, Fair Trade International, and 10,000 Villages. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Great job. So yeah. now we are coming to the question part. And in the chat, and let me go back to that. If it will let me. I think I'm going to have to stop sharing, because and then I can go to the chat. 
Uh, there was one question for you, Joseph, from earlier. And let me get back there. Or maybe I'll just ask Kara to ask it again. <laughs> um, Joseph, you uh, referenced a study from December of 21, I believe, that said that people would, uh, oh, I don't remember what it said, but people were more interested in using fair trade um, as a means to um, end child labor. I, I was just curious about that study where that was published and just a little bit more information about that because that's really um, interesting and intriguing. Um, definitely. Uh, I believe, and I can confirm this, but I'm pretty sure I got it off of a, a fair trade website. I'm pretty sure it was the uh, fair trade organization, the one of the main websites. Um, but what that study was describing was, and, and I can read it again, it was included uh, 184 producers, 122 community members, uh, I believe include um, fair trade members and uh, journalists, I believe, and other uh, other um, people, and they interviewed them, and they found that fair trade programs were more effective than international efforts, and so uh, that was published on these like uh, the, the main fair trade organization website, and that just shows how effective fair trade is in combating child labor and uh, combating these harsh things. Thank you, Joseph. Does anybody else have any questions for our ambassadors? You can ask them questions about the program if you'd like as well. Um, I'm really excited that there is someone from Floyd Central this year. Who is from Floyd Central? That would be me. Who is me? Sorry. Maddie. Hi, Maddie. I'm a Highlander too. Hi. <laughs> It's just really exciting when someone from the other side of the river joins the program. So yeah, uh, that's really cool. Go Islanders. Um, also, these are really great presentations. I think you guys did a really great job of taking some big ideas and big concepts and overcoming both technology and nerves uh, to present to a large group of people you don't know. So well done. Okay, we, we do have a question from the chat from Aaron Wiedemeyer, who actually helped me interview and choose these six ambassadors. Uh, she has asked, what has been the most impactful and or favorite thing that you guys have learned through the program so far? Anybody can jump in. I'd say for me personally, the most I guess impactful thing was when we went over kind of all the brands and seeing all that they own because it kind of just like really opened my eyes to how big like free trade is and it kind of just really makes fair trade all all more like all that more positive to me and it made me kind of realize like the weight of fair trade programs and like this program that we're doing and to kind of see the impact of that was nice. I think the most impactful thing for me was one of the first activities that we did together. I think it may have even been at like our first learning session where Patrick laid out some like fake dollar bills and we had to like, I, I was actually the one that counted them out. I remember that, but it was just crazy to see how unfair things really are. And to be honest, I really didn't know that much about fair trade before starting this program. And I feel like that was the thing that first opened my eyes to what an unequal world we live in and really kind of kickstarted my, my, just my passion for the program and for just learning about fair trade and what we can do. Mine's like similar to um, hers, but it's kind of like the last one that we did where we all kind of played a part and like the chain of like what Coco has to go through to like sell and then kind of like the money that comes back to the like producer and to like the farmer. And I ended up getting half, cause I was like the farmer, I ended up getting half a dollar bill. And so I actually keep it in my car just as a reminder of like, be aware of kind of like what you buy and like who this money goes back to. 
And so I look like I have certain things from this program that I kind of like keep around just to be like, this is a reminder of like, to like just be aware of kind of like what you're doing, what you're buying and that kind of thing. But now I'm like hyper aware of things. So it takes me forever to go to like a grocery store and like buy something. And I'm like, I can't go to the mall anymore. I just like thrift and that's like it. <laughs> so yeah. Does anyone else want to answer that one? Um, I feel like the most impactful thing for me was learning how much I could make a difference. Um, so, I'll, you know, when we mention these big corporations like Nestle or Mars, you know, they seem almost m like super powerful that like what can one teenager in high school do to, you know, impact it. And what Fair Trade and Just Creations and this program has showed me is that I can do a lot. And you know, helping serve the store and reading the information and hearing about these stories of these artisans being positively infect, affected by fair trade, it just, it, it just kind of gave me that encouragement and empowered me to, you know, that I have the ability to impact the world and to help push these great things. Any, 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 how about one more of you? Anybody else? I guess um, that means you. Go. Okay. Um, I kind of agree with Juliana, just in the sense that when we learned about the companies and everything that they own, like that's why I did my presentation on that tonight, just because it's so impactful to learn what these companies actually do, like how truly terrible they actually are, like the practices they have are so disregarding of human life and dignity and the way that fair trade remedies that it's so unlike i feel like what we've been focused on for the in the economy and it's just a new way of production that is so it brings back dignity to people and i think that's been really impactful to learn about and how much of a difference it can make so, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go on to another question. Uh, Jackie Vanetti has asked, and I think it's a question I need to answer. Where's your road trip in June? And actually, the ambassadors don't quite know the details yet. Uh, so I will just share. Uh, we're going to four different places uh, in the region. We're going to start at the Anshul Project, which is here in town, and uh, they deal with women in India mostly, and they make home goods. And they're actually here in town. And then we're going to go to a 10,000 Villages store in Cincinnati and just look at a different store and see how things are laid out. And I think you have all uh, probably processed the 10,000 Villages order uh, when you've been here. Then we are going to go to Lexington to Lucia's World Emporium, but she is also a wholesaler uh, of things from and I believe it's Guatemala and Joan, if, if it's that's incorrect, please correct me. Uh, then we're going to go to Berea, Kentucky, to a place called Peacecraft, uh, which is another store. And uh, then we're going to make that round trip and come back home. Uh, we are, Joan and I are still uh, putting the fine tuning about the trip, but I hope you guys are as excited about it as we are. Are there any other questions? Let me go through the chat to make sure I didn't miss any. And I just want you guys, uh, the ambassadors, just to read some of these comments. Uh, great presentations. How inspiring to see your passion. So impressed by all of you. What an inspiring night. Uh, you all got good jobs and, uh, and applause emojis. Um, so I just, you, I, I couldn't be more proud of you if you were my own kids, actually. Um, so any other questions? Oh, there's another way. Well, uh, are the uh, presentations going to get some social media fame? Actually, I'm. This has been recorded. Uh, it will be edited uh, in such a way so that Olivia, probably that point where you had some technical difficulties, will be edited out, um, and then it will go up on our YouTube channel. Uh, and just to plug that a little bit, uh, last year's presentations are there. We have all of our Fair Trade Friday videos are there, it's, uh, it's a great place to go and kind of see, uh, see the work that we do in a different way. 
Is there anything else that anybody would like to say? Uh, thank you, ambassadors. You all have done an amazing job. Uh, you all should be proud of yourself. I know I am, and I think I can speak for Joan. I, I'm sure she is proud of you as well. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, we appreciate your, uh, your patience with us, with our technology issues, as well as your support. Uh, for you parents who are here, I hope you are proud of your children. They are amazing. Um, so thank you all. And come see us at Just Creations. We're open Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.